so let's uh, last class we started doing a kind of uh, draft of ontologies right we started from uh, a graph right and went going uh, to understand uh, how a graph becomes an ontology in some sense right so we started talking a bit about semantics so if you remember I started by a description and we went to the graph model right so we, we started arguing oh we need some more semantics this is the idea and I talked about semantic web and we started doing a graph right and then first thing is I told you we need a controlled vocabulary right so it was the first thing we need to take care is controlled vocabulary and then I told you we can use an URI right so let, let us see who can tell me where we use URIs in, in uh, semantic web in which parts of the graph so consider a graph in which parts of the graph we use URIs we can use in nodes right but any node no which nodes we don't use URIs literal values okay so there are nodes we call literal okay for example strings like this name here okay ah. Ah. this you usually put a square to represent them okay they are literal values they are not your eyes otherwise everything is an URI. So I show you that nodes can be URIs and also the properties or the edges, right? The edges can be URIs. So I show you the advantage of using URIs, right? So for example, let's take again this example. Uh, I want to answer the following question. Which animals live in Asia? Okay, so I want to answer this question. So if you may imagine, how can I do that in the actual web? In the actual, in the web today? How can I do that? It's not possible. But if the web is semantic, I can answer this question. Because first, I will have a node which represents Asia right and I showed you that we can use for example uh, geonames did you remember geonames okay so in geonames there is an URI a single URI for Asia okay then everybody that stays in Asia points to this URI for example okay. but it's not just Asia that has an URI also the property origin for example can be an URI okay and I don't know if uh, geonames defines these URIs for properties I don't know but can be it's possible okay but we can have in some place some vocabulary that defines this URI whose meaning is the origin of something okay can be for example some biology or biodiversity or ecological system okay that defines these URIs for the properties everybody understood the idea of properties having URIs yes okay and then I told you about the linked data yes 
the notion of linked data and I show you the example of geonames, right? And I started talking about ontology, right? And I told you that ontology is a discussion, right? How much formal. Now we will start going deep in the semantics. Okay? Now we will start arguing. What is semantics? Okay, so it's a philosophy class today. Okay? Let's look the sky and ask why we are here. What is our purpose at the end of the life? And it's more or less like that, okay? <laughs> so now I will talk to you about semantics, which is a difficult word. It's not easy to talk about semantics because semantics is something for the humans, right? So I will get another another group of slides. So Chomsky uh, talked uh, about semantics. Chomsky is non Chomsky is uh, famous in the discussion uh, in in the uh, literature. Okay, he has, but he is is an important person because he he treated literature. Uh, and, and writing and language as uh, something uh, almost formal, okay? So we study him. I don't know, you probably studied that in formal languages. Who, who, he, who studied Chomsky in formal languages? Nobody? Okay. So, but you can study him in computer science when you study uh, formal languages, okay? Because he treated language as a something formal. He tried to understand the expressivity of something. Okay? And you can see this, uh, this phrase, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Okay? Good. So, the, the challenge here is, did you understand that? <laughs> it's more or less poetry, right? Okay. But, the I don't know which picture is missing here. Sorry, but okay. So the uh, uh, the syntax of this of this phrase is not hard to define. Okay, why? Because syntax is something that you can define rules of construction. Right? First comes the the subject, then the, the predicate, and so on and so forth. So you can Define how you can use the language, right? And only the, the poetry, the hard poetry will, let's say, go against these rules, okay? But usually, in the language, everybody follows the rules. So it's easy to follow the syntax of this phrase. But what about the semantics? For example, can a machine read this phrase and understand or interpret the semantics. Colorless? Do you know what is colorless? Without color. Sem cor. Colorless. Right? Colorless green ideas. <laughs> Sleep furiously. Ideias verdes sem cor dormem furiosamente. <laughs> and then you can get a machine and try to give the, 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 the phrase so the machine will interpret it. Okay? If you want to, 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 if you want to, uh, to do something in semantics, you can go to this program here. This is really an interesting experience. I spent uh, I spent uh, a lot of uh, many hours talking with let me remember her name is uh, 
uh, else. It's not this side, but this side has the pointer to the right side. <laughs> Let me see where is the right. Uh, this is also good software, but this is a 3D software. But I'm talking about another software, which is Alice Boot. But now they, they remove it. Because they have a, a something that if you are looking for Alice, I think it's Alice Boot. Something like that. Alice. I don't know if it's this one. I don't remember. Pandora Boot. Yeah, probably is this one. Okay, so you can come here and tell. Hello, Alice. How are you? And uh, Alice, hi there. I am functioning within normal parameters. See? Talk to me. Uh, um. I, I'm wondering uh, which is your favorite color. My favorite color is green. <laughs> what is yours? <laughs> And now you can tell something like, you know, I don't see colors. Colors. So, I, I don't see colors. So, how can I know my favorite color interest goes <laughs> you see in some point you achieve uh, the limit right I mean this is she she is uh, trying to to she she probably the the, the boat didn't understand what I told so she's trying to do a kind of, uh, in Portuguese is enrolar. She's trying to do a kind of deviation, you know? But, but, but it's really a good program, okay? It, it talks a lot. I, I spent hours talking with it, okay? It really, it's really good. Yes, I think so. I think they use, they use uh, for this reason they have uh, this open software, they use all these conversations to find the, the limits and try to, to improve the machine. Okay? So, but the thing is, it mostly, mostly it's syntax, so, so Alice must understand the syntax, right? And when you go to semantics, it's much harder, because semantics is something uh, that is, is hard to define. So, I will go with you. In a kind of trip now in the semantics, okay? And this trip becomes of how do we see the world? So I told you that is a philosophical thing, right? Uh, what is okay? Okay, so I'm here, right? Let's go. So let's talk about knowledge representation. And to understand knowledge representation, the question is, how do we represent knowledge as we represent? In some sense, let, let's think about databases, let's think about uh, XML that we studied, let's think about uh, uh, ontologies I will talk to you. Okay? There is something in the root of the way we represent knowledge which is in the root of the way we see the world. Okay? So, 
I showed you briefly. I, re I get back again the things that you studied in database that you probably don't remember anymore, but it's just to get again. So when you went to database, okay, you must. I, do you remember that you started studying this model, entity relationship? Did you remember that? That you studied that? Who can tell me what is this model? I will not give you a class of entity relationship, you know, it's too much, but it's, it's a model of database to, to let me show you. If you remember, there are several stages in database, okay? And the first stage we call conceptual model is this one, okay? So the conceptual model is we want to produce a model, okay, to describe your your real world. Who can tell me what is a real world in database? For example, if I want to produce a system of uh, Lord of the Rings, okay, Gandalf. Who knows who is Gandalf? This is a test to know who is who is a nerd. Okay, who is no Gandalf? Okay, Gandalf the Grey. Okay, so Gandalf. So if I want to produce a system of uh, Lord of the Rings, okay, do you think that Lord of the Rings is the real world? It's not a. It's not a. a a psychiatric test to sell if you are a normal person. Okay. Do you think it's a real world? In databases, we use a name real world, which is the word that I want to model. Okay. And this word can be even the token Lord of the Rings. It's anything, any word. In some, in some contexts, people call it mini word or can call it uh, universe of discourse. Okay? Which is the thing I want to model. Okay? And then there is the thing I want to model. It can be something in a company. I want to develop a system and I want to model it. Okay? Then I need something to model. Something is not, see, this is really highly important. It's not something to, to, to implement the database. No, I'm not in implementing the database yet. I want to see and model the world. Okay? And to do that, we use, for example, the entity relationship model. And then now I'm working with biologists. And the interesting thing, you, you see that biologists do almost the same thing. They do a kind of entity relationship of the living beings. Okay? So they go to the birds and ask the birds, how are you feeling today? And that, no, it's not that, but it's like, okay, so, <clears throat> so this, this model was developed by Peter Chan in 76. And the notions is entity, if you remember, and the entity is something, some object in the real world, which we can identify it, and has independent existence, right? And in some sense, we can group the entities in a class of entities we call set of entities, okay? And there are the relationships. So, okay. But before we go there, let's talk about what is the real world. And this is important to, to our ontologies because the things we see here is almost, there is an interesting paper I can show you that they, they tell that when, when we do an entity relationship, we are already doing something like an ontology. The problem in the past was we draw this entity relationship and we didn't follow putting it inside the computer. We do this guy, and then afterwards we lose semantics when we map it to a database. But we talk about that. So, why, why someone invented the model entity relationship? The entity. And 
I didn't put the slides here, but if you see classes in the object-oriented model, okay, there is the notion of class, right? And the instance of a class is an object, right? It's the same notion of entity. And we can map them. We can map class to entity and vice versa. And why we model things like that? The thing is how we look the real world. It's the third time that Lucas see this class, right? <laughs> I don't know. You, I, I already did that here? No, right? Okay. So, today is the day I call the matrix day. Okay? It's the day you uh, leave the room thinking differently about the world. You look everything until now I see. You see? Like matrix when the guys fired the bullets, pow, 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 and they, and the bullets stopped in the air, and it got one bullet. Right? You remember that? And then he see everything like bites running gun. And, and, and this is the thing we you do now. So prepare yourself, because it's something that people cry on the night. Wow, oh, my life is a bunch of bites. Okay, so what is a mountain? My question is, what is a mountain? How can you tell me what is a mountain? In Portuguese, o que é uma montanha? <laughs> Everybody is afraid. O que é uma montanha? Ah, placa tectônica. You study at that school, right? The problem is, the question is, pay attention. A mountain doesn't exist. And why I'm telling you that? Suppose that a mountain exists, okay? Let's get the Fuji mountain, okay? And you tell me, okay, but the Fuji mountain exists, I see it. Right? And I ask you, okay, let's consider it exists. In fact, it exists. Where is the limits of the mountain? Where it begins and where it ends. If I get each people in the earth and ask to draw the limits of the mountain, nobody will draw the same limits. <laughs> Why? Because the mountain is just an idea in your mind. There is no object mountain. There is no such object. There is no limits. Okay? It, there is no place where the mountain starts and the mountain ends. There is no limits of the mountain. So, the mountain is an image in your mind of something in the real world. The real world is not organized in classes, is not organized in objects. There is no object in the real world. Okay? Nothing in the real world is as in your mind. Our mind do a trick trying to organize the world so you can capture it and understand it. But, I mean, if I ask you what is a bus station, for example, what is a bus station? And then you tell me, okay, the bus station is that place where you go to get the bus. Then I ask you, okay, but the bus is part or not of the bus station? <laughs> if you tell me, no, the bus is part of the bus station, and, but if, you, if, you, if the bus leaves, <laughs> what happens? <laughs> so part of the bus station leaves? So the object is something in your mind. And this is explained by serious works in, uh, I don't know how to tell in English, psychology is psychiatry, right? Psychiatry or something like that. Okay, so, huh? psychology, right, psychology. So, psychology explains that. Development psychology, they tell that uh, a child, in the beginning of their lives, they don't uh, have the notion of objects as persistent things, okay? And for this reason, 
when you when when you have when, when you see a kid do you know this this thing you do with the kid that you hide yourself behind a a, a, a I don't know how to tell in English, even in Portuguese. <laughs> lençol. Lençol is a sheet, right? When you hide yourself behind a lençol, okay? And then you leave it and the, the kid, eh, because it, the, the, the kid sees, oh, this, this guy appeared for nothing. What's happening here? And then you hide yourself again. And then you leave and it appears again. Oh, hey, 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 again. So the kid will, the kid will be, this, this will be seem funny for the kid, even if you do ten times. And then you ask yourself, why this is funny ten times? I did that the same thing. Because you may imagine the fault. A kid cannot understand that an object persists. And that when you put an object in front of the other object, you're just hiding the object. There is no notion of object in the mind of the kid. So the kid sees the image. And that is your image. And then you disappear. Because the kid doesn't see there is an object in front. And then there is another object. This is an abstraction of your mind. So for the kid, you disappeared. And then you appear again. So this is really funny. <laughs> and then you disappear. You may imagine if he... You, you have some guy here that just disappears, okay? And then appear again and you tell, what's happening here? The world is changing, right? And then it disappears again and appear again. And, oh, okay, I'm, I'm crazy or something, right? So this is the idea. But the kid, you, you, for the kid, it's funny, okay? And then there are a lot of details of this, but the idea is that... Uh, in the real world, there is no objects. Things change all the time. Well, a living being, for example, all cells of your body will change in some years. Okay? And so, in materially telling, you are not the same in t 10 years. You are not the same. Each cell of your body changes, for example. But even in this case, you think it's the same person. Because... An object that persists along the time is uh, something that uh, the mind needs to think about the world. This is the, the summary of the thing, right? The, the, this is interesting. Nervous system were developed via natural selection to represent objects so that organisms may interact with external world. So the thing is, imagine that you don't do that. It's impossible to interact with the world. Because you need to think the world organized as objects to interact. So it's a powerful mechanism of our minds. But the minds invented that. It's something that is projected in our minds. Okay? And there is also the thing of memory. Okay? And the memory is connected to the thing of uh, what we call... Uh, stereotypes. Uh, we have a limited memory, okay? And we don't have time to do that, but there is a, a thing that I do here to test your memory. Lucas was the assistant last time, right? And uh, the thing is, um, imagine that how many chairs we have in this class? Let's say 50 chairs, right? Okay. Then you look to this class, and if your memory your mind cannot interpret this as a chair and, and tell all the other chairs are the same, just in different positions. Right? It's something that your mind does. It's quick, like boat. Right? You enter here, you look, and you know that all are the same class of thing, and they are just in positions, different positions, and that's it. So for your memory, this is a powerful mechanism. Because you don't need to store each of the chairs. So you may imagine that you are, in, you are not capable of generalizing things. Okay? So you remember each chair as an individual instead of classifying it. So it will be impossible for your memory to store such amount of information. 
So we do that all the time, and this is a mechanism we call stereotype. We stereotype, and this is from uh, physic psychology. No, it's psychology. Is it, this is not uh, this is the word stereotype in psychology is not a uh, a bad word. It's a word to tell that we stereotype everything. We stereotype people. Okay. How we stereotype people? When you look a person, your your mind try to put in a kind of category, okay? And you categorize everybody. For this reason, some people tell you know, first time I see this person, I don't like him or her. And why you do that? You never talk with this person, and you don't like it. It's because your mind, when the, you, you first time you see the person. Your mind do the first thing your mind always do, classifies it. It has a huge database and runs the algorithm and start classifying this person. And sometimes you just associate this person that you don't know <laughs> for something in your database that is bad, even if this person has no uh, is a good person and is probably someone who you can. Even be a friend, but if even in this case your mind will tell you no, know, first time I see this person, I don't like him. And, and this is the way we do stereotypes. And in this case, it can be bad, but you usually is a good thing. Okay? Without stereotypes, is also, we cannot live. Why not? A stereotype is the kernel of learning. Why? For example, I know this is a, a watch. I know that, okay? So I stereotyped it. So when I get, I know how to use it, okay? I just get and I know how to use it. And you can give me. The human beings is the best engine to do that, you know? I read a paper recently. They, they, they are trying, still trying to find how human beings are so good on classifying things. We are really good on that. You can show me. Millions of different kinds of watches. And in just in a second, I will know that is a watch. And how you do that is a kind of potent mechanism of your mind. And then, when you classify it, in fractions of seconds, you know how to use it. I know that I can get it, I can do the thing. Even a new, a new watch I never saw before. Even a new one. I can do the same thing. Why? Because I know the class of the things. When you enter in a room and you see a chair, you know that you can sit on top of it. Right? Why? Because you classify it in the first time. Okay? So, we classify everything in the world so we can predict what we can do with the things. Okay? So, we classify animals, we classify Persons, we classify things and everything. So this is our mind. And this is the root of semantics. This is the root of how we interpret the word. Why? Because if you think with me, the word is the word. There is no mountains, there is no bus station, there is no classes in the world. The word is the word. Everything is in our mind. And what is this thing that is in our mind? Is the semantics. We give semantics to the word. So when you tell me mountain, you are putting semantics on this thing. When you tell me bus station, you are putting semantics on this thing. So this is the way we give semantics to the things around us. And this is our potent mechanism. You see, what is this pictures of? Huh? Robots, right? All these three are completely different. But you have some mechanism in your mind. You can see completely different images and you can classify them as robots. You are really good on these things. You cannot imagine. And uh, this is a challenge, right? Ah, this is good. What is it on the, on the right there? <laughs> You know, nobody knows that, even me, okay. But it's just to tell you, okay, you can, okay. So, going back to entity relationship, there is the relationship, and we usually think 
uh, the world as objects and relations of these objects, how the objects relate. So, in our minds, the things are uh, in compartments. And the interesting thing is, the most interesting thing, if you study physics, and you go down, down, down in physics, you arrive in a point, I don't know if you know about the uh, contradiction of particle and wave. You know this contradiction? Everybody knows this contradiction? Particle and wave? When you go to atom level, photon level, in fact, right? Uh, and you try to study the behavior of a photon, to tell if a photon is a particle or a photon is a wave. Okay? Because there are two different things, right? A wave is a kind of vibration in something, right? It's a wave. And a particle is a particle, okay? Then they started to study, is a photon a particle or a wave? And the interesting thing is, it depends. Depends of what? Depends. If you try to, to look on it as a particle, it behaves as a particle. <laughs> if you try to look on it as a wave, it behaves as a wave. And then you tell me, but it's impossible. I know, but is that? This is the word. I'm telling you. <laughs> it's true. Nobody until now explained that. This is what we call the contradiction of particle wave. And the same thing that behaves as particle and wave. And it depends. If you put a sensor to get a particle, you will get a particle. If you put a sensor to detect a wave, you will get a wave. So the same thing. And even though for us it's impossible. So, and, and this, I like this contradiction because uh, I think even in the world, we try to tell, we try to think things as objects, as self-contained things and how they relate. But even this is an abstraction. Because you may think, okay, Andrea is a subject or a relation. No, Andrea is object. Not. Not necessarily, because I can be an entity, for example. Andrea is an entity. Okay, but Andrea is also a bunch of entities, my organs, for example, that relate by themselves. So, there are relations here. And then you go down, 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 and you say, okay, uh, uh, the decision of w what is an entity, what is a relation, depends on the way I see the word, I look at the word. Okay? Okay, this is some details of uh, uh, hierarchy and so on and so forth. Okay, of the model entity relationship. And the interesting thing is if, so I'm talking about ontologies, okay, and I read an interesting paper telling that if we got the entity relationship model and we go further, we could, in the past, have something we call today ontology. Okay? But what happens? What happens is when you want to, to develop a database, okay, you map your model to another model we call relational. Do you remember that? Tables, right? Tables and, uh, and uh, tuples, right? Columns. And we have a way to map the things, right? I don't know if you remember, but for example, you, you get something that an entity and map the entity to a, a, it's not here, but you map an entity to a table and then you map in a, a, a relationship to another table or to something else. It depends on the, the cardinality and so on and so forth. And what happens when you do the mapping? Who can tell me what happens when you do the mapping? Nobody knows? You lose part of the semantics. Because when you go to the relational database, you are interested in, in storing values of attributes and so on. But all the things you develop it in the entity relationship things are lost. So you don't capture 
the semantics the semantics of the things so for this reason my question is the semantics of entity relationship stays the answer is no what was lost this is the thing what we lost when we map the things to the relational model so now in the ontologies we try to get back again what we lost we get try to get back again the semantics but now we want machines reading and interpreting the semantics so let's go back to our graph because the thing is I'm telling that what we want in the ontology is formalize some knowledge okay and the thing is knowledge and semantics is based on the th way we look and see the world okay and we see the world as objects classes relations right so the basic idea here is we try to capture the things and put on the computer but there is something we lose in the traditional models we will try to capture here in our graph and I will show you how we will do that the first thing is a class so we will go back to the class why? because we think the world as classes when you have stereotypes okay so the, the thing is that sometimes I stay thinking on the night when I'm more philosophical and looking the stars and the moon I start to think imagine with me if we are not humans okay we are different kind of living thing in the space okay and we think differently about the real world okay so we are some kind of thing I don't know a jelly or something like that okay and the way we think is different from us okay so this uh, we are this jelly and this jelly doesn't think in classes for example why not because they have a different kind of mind okay the mind is not a brain with neurons is a kind of uh, colored uh, balls inside the jelly that has can be shine and something beautiful to explain okay but then what happens you may imagine that if these jelly living beings they think different and they will design a machine okay the question is do these beings will organize the knowledge in classes so the thing is why we do that we do that in machines because we think about the world like that okay so the model of semantics in machines is a reflection of our mind okay so what is a class uh, when we want to represent it in a, in a computer we can think a class as a template the notion of templates is strange, but this is the thing when we use the um, when you use the stereotype. Okay, the idea of stereotyping is the ability of forgetting. Okay, if you want to understand. Uh, the, the the idea that is uh, I don't know if I, I already told you about George Luis Borges. Do you know the this guy, George Luis Borges? No? Oh your background in literature is really poor, right? George Luis Borges is highly and highly important author. Okay, so when you go at home, please type in your Google 
George Luis Borges too. So uh, he has um, a book when there is a, a tale about Funes. Funes he calls Funes o memorioso, and Funes has a problem. He cannot forget anything. So imagine a person that cannot forget anything, anything. Everything I see, I can remember. So, for example, if you leave this room and I ask you about each of these chairs, because now I'm looking on all these chairs of the class, right? Nobody will distinguish the chairs. Even me. Why? Because my mind just generalized it and forgot the details, but not Funes. Funes will remember the tiniest detail of each chair, which is different of the other chair, which is different of the other chair. For example, the red of this chair is not exactly as the red of this other chair here because there is, you know, so it will remember everything all his life. And the thing, and the interesting thing in the history is that he cannot live, in fact. Why? Because we need to forget things, to abstract. So, what is a generalization? Is an exercise of forgetting the details and just keep the mind in the main things. So when you do, for example, when you look people and you do the stereotype, what you do, you forget the details and you generalize. What is a generalization? So you know the color of the hair, the eyes, the things. So you just get some points and you generalize the person. Okay? For example, my algorithm, my own algorithm, it starts on the eyes. And I know that because if you are using the sunglasses, I will not recognize you. You know that? It's true. It's true. If you if you are you, if you are in some point there and you are using sunglasses, I will not recognize you. It's true. I don't know why. I have some algorithm that uh, sticks to the things in the eyes. So, for example, in my generalization algorithms, something in the eyes is highly important. So, if I cannot see your eyes, my algorithms will break and I cannot recognize. But, but the thing is, your algorithms for to generalize people is based on just a set of characteristics. It's not easy to explain. Now people are studying that, okay? They are putting uh, sensors in the brains of uh, mouses. <laughs> it's true. They got they get the mouse, poor mouse. They put some uh, sensors in the brain of the mouse, okay? And put the mouse in front of some um, other animals or persons or whatever, so the mouse can recognize. And what they do? They track the eye of the mouse. Because another thing you learn today, so another matrix thing. You think, you think, you see everything. Right? For example, for example, now, take a look in the class, all the class, you, everybody, take a look in all the class. Okay? Do you think that you can do that? I'm here uh, one hour and ten minutes looking at. Do you think I can see all the class? It's impossible. It's not because your sensors. Your sensors are right. But it's your brain. Your brain cannot get this image and, 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 and uh, have focus in everything. For this reason, Sometimes you are looking for an object and it is in front of you. Right? You remember that? And you cannot, you don't, you don't see it, right? But how can it be possible? It's in front of me. Then they are studying that. The thing is, 
you think you are seeing everything, but in fact you are not. Your eyes, it tracks some main positions and creates in your brain the idea that you are looking to everything, but you are not looking to everything. Okay, so it's a kind of uh, image in your mind. But how it's possible, Andre? It's simple. It's just a trick. Another thing, if you see some movie about uh, ants or bees, usually or, or or spiders, usually they put the eye of the spider or the eye of uh, of an ant, and is is like hundreds of eyes. Did you see that? It's several small images, right? It's like the spider or the or the bee is looking or hundreds of eyes, right? You know that? Did you see? Okay. Do you think that the spider of the bee look like that? Do you see the word like that? Do you think? Because if you get the eye of an ant and you amplify it, it will be something like Something like that, right? It's a bunch of small eyes. Okay? Okay? If you see the arachnophobia, dun 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 dun, I see this, the eyes of the spider. So, and, and, and it sees it's a bunch of small eyes. When the director of the movie shows you from the eyes of the spider, it shows you several small images, right? And then you think, yes, probably in this way the spiders look on the world. I remember when I was a, as a kid, there is an old movie, it's the invasion of the giant ants. You know, you see that? This is an old movie, right? It's a really old movie. Probably nobody of you knows the, what, which movie is that. The, the ants become huge and started to kill human beings. Okay, but what happens is, uh, these huge ants has these several eyes, but in fact, in fact, they probably see the world as we see the world. And why is that? Because even you, your eye is like that. If you get an eye and you, you study it, you have things we call conis and bastonetes, which are sensors, which are just Bunches of small uh, dots, which are sensors. So, you don't see the world as you think you see. Right now, you are seeing a lot of dots. And why I'm not seeing dots? My vision is okay, it's not dots. Eh? Your brain has some kind of tricky trick. And then you think you are seeing everything as you are looking at everything, but you are not looking at So, this is just to tell you that our brain is capable of giving to us an image of the world, which is an image you need to interact with the world. And the same thing is with generalization. Okay? You leak something and you bring it in the next moment, you generalize it. You get the most important things. And when we represent it in a computer, we think about what will be a skeleton of something. So, the best approach is let us imagine that this thing has some properties. Okay? So, a human being. Which is the properties of the human being? The height, the color, the color of the eyes. The hair, blah blah blah. So we think in properties and we give values to this property. This is a way of generalizing. Okay, so let's now try to think a graph, think a graph which represents it. Okay, so let's start with a node when we talk. This node is a species, represents a species, okay? And then you ask me, but Andrea, what is a species? And I tell you, a species 
is a class. Class of things. So if you are doing a model, is an entity. Species is an entity, for example. Or if you are using object oriented, is a class. But now we are constrained to a graph. We want to represent this information in a graph. So we tell, okay, we give an edge. And then, <coughs> this is an important thing. What is RDF type? This thing. Okay, so RDF is a namespace. Okay, namespace, remember namespace? So there is a new RI where is stored the controlled vocabulary of RDF. Okay, so it's something like that. Let me show you. Let me tell you. Bye, Alice. No, it's no, it's bye, bye, Alice. Sayonara. Alice is there. Okay. So let's put here RDF uh, schema. Okay. Now I will show you something interesting. Let me get the URI of RDF. Let me see where is it. Okay. So this is the URI, for example, of RDF. So if you type this thing here, okay. It will give me an XML uh, document. Okay? In the future, I will connect you XML with RDF. Not now, in the future. But the important thing. Ah, it's not an XML, right? Oh, no, no, no. It's an any tree. Oh, God. No, I don't want an any tree. This is the any tree, right? Uh, I don't know how it's showing me. Okay, so there is a guy here we call type or not. No, it's not here. I know what it is. Let me get it. Let me see if it's this one. Okay, this one. Let me see if this one brings me. Okay. It's not XML, but let's focus on the RDF type. This one. RDF type. Okay. So the namespace here is RDF is this prefix here. Okay. So there is an address on the web which begins with this prefix here and at the end we have type okay. 
we can look on it and tell this is a kind of controlled vocabulary, okay? And this prefix here, this prefix here, I can tell you this prefix is RDF. Will be this prefix, okay? So when I tell RDF type, I'm talking about this guy here, which is defined in a controlled vocabulary of RDF, okay? And if I tell that species type class and type is a new RI of a controlled vocabulary which has a specific meaning which is the type of the node and also class is RDFS class, okay? I can tell that species is a class. And then after that I can tell that my lizard, the type of my lizard is a species. Okay? So this is an interesting thing because a species is a class. Okay? And then my lizard is an instance of the class. So my lizard is an species. Vebegalensis is a kind of species. And if you go further, uh, we can tell that there is a node origin whose type, again the type, is property. So I can interpret that. I told you in the next, last class, origin is a uh, the, the, the graph on top is a kind of parallel graph. Okay? It means that I can use origin there. You see there, origin. I can use it, origin Asia. And origin is defined here. And the type is property. And I can also tell that the domain of origin is a species. Which means that when you describe something as the class of uh, species, you can use this property to describe it. So what am I doing here? I'm trying to put in a graph mode the way we think about the word, we represent the word. But the difference here, and I will show you that deeply as deeply as possible is when you produce um, for example a database schema you distinguish the schema and the data okay and you cannot describe the schema the schema is something that you just put the labels the types and that's it the schema is not the part of your data in some sense you are not knowledge okay here everything is part of the same graph okay so uh, the class and the instance of the class everything is part of a big graph so i can describe the object but i can also describe the class I can describe everything I want and the machine can read. I can tell that something is subclass of something. For example, a species is subclass of genus, if I wish. And both are classes. And I go there and tell, okay, I can, you see, I start to connect the graph and this graph tells me which are the classes, which are the properties, how the properties are applied to the classes. And they can be read. They can be read in the same way you can read these things. In the same way uh, it is like for a computer everything is part of a graph. 
So anything you want to do is navigating off this graph that try to put semantics in these things. So for example, let's go back to that example of XML. Okay? Right? This example of XML. And the, the guy tell me that, okay, the problem in XML is I cannot know that these two guys here is um, a position and these two guys here are uh, the size. Right? If we are doing that in XML, okay? Oh, in, in RDF, first, you may imagine that we have a class we can call point. And this class of point has the meaning. This is a point in the space. And not just that. This class can be shared throughout the world. Anyone in the world can use the same class. Okay? So, I can define, okay, I have this class. Please, people, everybody who wants to describe a point, use my class. Okay? Uh, and then, what will happen here? So, you see here that this position is an instance of the class point. So, a machine can interpret that these two coordinates are a point, are part of a point. Okay? Uh, the other two are the shape of an ellipse. Okay? And the other guy is a spot. So, what this paper shows is that you change something that is in the schema for something in which you try to describe the things as we think about the world and in a such a way that machines can read it and interpret it so the machines can know this is an instance of a class that I, I can know or not and this, is, this is, can be a subclass of something else and this can be related of this thing in, such, in this way or that way and the most important thing, there is only one way to describe things. There are not two ways, two forms of creating a graph. And uh, one important thing when we do this kind of description is what we call ontology. The ontology will be something, is also a graph, but will be something that we organize, for example, our classes and our properties. And they will be published. So, for example, okay, I want to have a standard way to describe some geographic locations. Okay, so I can create a geographic ontology. And in this geographic ontology, I will define the basic notions. The notion of a point, a distance orientation and so on and so forth and if my ontology is successful and people start using it the machines can take advantage of the ontology to interpret correctly the data so now we have things that machines can read and can use to interpret and even in the, sca in the case that the machine doesn't know the ontology Okay? Doesn't know the ontology. It can do associations. You can have mappings of one ontology to the other. And the machines can infer the meaning of sensing relating to another meaning he knows, for example. It knows. So, one interesting example to look is the gene ontology. Okay? What gene ontology did? So, you may imagine that we have... Uh, we may have a protein called TNF. 
Luana, what is TNF? <laughs> Luana knows what's TNF. You see? It's a self-destroying protein. Okay? Yes. Okay? So, it's a protein in which the, the, the cell can use. It means tumor necrosis factor. Okay? Tumor means tumor, right? And necrosis is dying or something. And factor is a factor to define uh, that uh, something will die. And, and one thing, first thing you may think is uh, there is this gene ontology database and TNF has its own URI. Okay? So you may imagine TNF as a node of the graph. Okay? I can even do the following if you wish. I can write here TNF and I can tell you that protein since TNF is a protein okay I can tell that protein is a class for example so type class and I can tell that TNF is a protein. This is the graph. So, in this case, a machine can read that and can know, okay, TNF is a protein. Okay. But, not just that. A protein has several properties, you see? So, uh, let's get some properties. For example, uh, it's hard to read, right? A description, for example. So a description is a property. And... Oh, no. TNF is not a protein. TNF is a gene. It's a gene. Sorry. Everything I told you is, is false. No, it's not right. A pro it's a gene. But a gene produces a protein. Not necessarily. It can produce several, but it's okay. A gene. Okay? But TNF has a description. So we can have here an edge description which points to a literal field here which has the description. Okay? And this, the fields, the field you see in the form is like a graph that the computer puts in a form way for mortals like you. Okay? But in fact, behind the scenes, you can, you may imagine something like a graph. Okay? And, for example, in this graph, you have their gene ontology, links, and there is, for example, uh, this node here of TNF, okay, is a cellular component, is found in the cellular component, uh, Recycle endosome. So you may imagine here that I can have uh, I can have here uh, endosome. Let me put it in the same color blue because it's also a class. Endosome. So this guy here is also a class. Okay? For example. And or not. Not necessarily a class. So doesn't matter now.
let's but the interesting thing here is, is the TNF there is a relationship that the cellular component and the sun and if you see here I am showing you that recycling and the sun has uh, its own URI so it's another node in the graph and I can follow linking things okay so the basic idea is uh, I can represent a knowledge as a graph but now formalizing it so it's not a free graph it's not a graph draw it as you wish no there are rules to organize your graph okay there are formal rules so there is a way to tell this is a class and this is an instance of a class this is a property this is a value of a property this property belongs to this guy and you can you you start to build your graph around these notions okay and this is the basic of what distinguishes a graph in general of an ontology which is much more formal and one research I'm doing now which is an interesting research is how can we do the bridge from one to the other right so imagine that I get anything any resource and I map it in a graph but this graph has, is not formal it's something informal because I got for example an XML file or something and now I want to transform it in an ontology and this is really really interesting because you, you can start to analyze the words the relations the things and try to find uh, how to map or how to uh, bridge it to an ontology okay and several people today are uh, are looking for it because the interesting thing in the future is the following when we study ontologies I think now we have the tools to produce descriptions that machine can read and can use highly highly useful the problem is it's highly expensive to produce data in this way. For example, gen ontology that I showed you is probably a highly expensive knowledge base. Why is it expensive? First, each biologist or each researcher that puts data in the knowledge base will take a lot of time because, for example, you want to tell, let's consider you want to tell that TNF was found in the endosome in the past it was easy because it's just typing a text you just write text, okay? found in the endosome, so it's quick now, take time because you must find endosome in the hierarchy there and then when you find you must point it instead of just writing so it takes time to produce knowledge like that it takes time it's expensive who, who produces and then there is the, the some, some probably I don't know but probably hired people which take care of the quality right the kind of editors, okay, curators, we call curators. And what the curators does, they guarantee the quality of the information. If, if some crazy guy enters here and starts typing crazy things, how can I assure that you not pollute my knowledge base? Is something of trust. Again, your topic now is everybody's waiting your presentation to understand the right so the thing is 
the thing here is uh, it's highly expensive uh, to produce that and for this reason I am interested in the way people follow using their standard way to describe things tags for example I put videos now I put the several videos and I put tags right it's easy you just write tags so we may imagine if the YouTube tells me no 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 you not write tags you use an ontology and then uh, just drop it you know I don't have time so the interesting thing is how we can uh, the, the humans follow using the array and the computers try to figure out what's happening what they are, we are trying to tell this is an interesting research questions? yeah this is a good question right everybody can do and in this is sometimes this is a problem right the, uh, uh, I'm just starting this is a draft of ontology I, I will give you uh, next class we will give you a formal course of ontology since the beginning but the, the idea is when you produce a knowledge base you can have a central model and you can have what we call closed world assumption and the closed world assumption I, I mentioned in the last class tells that you can know the difference of what's true and what's not true okay? so for example in a relational database when you design in a schema okay, you tell this field is mandatory okay. this field is an integer this field is a date okay? Okay. you define all these things and if someone try to put a new record which is not uh, an integer as described or not, not a data set what happens the database will not accept because the database has the all elements to decide what is right what is wrong okay it's closed so we call closed word assumption the problem with the closed word assumption it's not good to produce collaborative knowledge why because collaborative knowledge it raises uh, uh, in an uncentralized way okay so we must have this network of ideas that connects themselves is not centralized okay and if you allow people to produce things in parallel and connect in a distributed way you can ha even have contradictions Someone will tell that's integer, other guy will tell that's not an integer, it's a real or something else, and then you can even have contradiction. And this is what we call open world assumption. The open world assumption is you can never be 100% sure that something is right or wrong. Never. You can have some kind of parameters to, do, to define things. But never the control. And we can also, in this case, have that any person can produce a new ontology, modify an existing ontology. So you can get an ontology, any ontology on the web, and you can change it. Not the source. You produce a local description that changes the original ontology, for example extend an ontology so everything is connected and everybody can include change and modify but how can we control this thing? okay which is uncentralized this is the challenge the modern challenge of ontologies okay we are trying to 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 find so uh, in some cases you control by authority so there are these big institutions that produces an ontology and the institution is highly important and people start using this ontology and by authority you will be the guy that defines ontology. Okay? And usually it's like that. 
One thing is, people is not trained to produce ontologies. So usually in the research in the in the academy, when people start producing a new research, everybody thinks they want they need to produce a new ontology. And this is not a good idea because if everybody produces a new ontology, we will have a kind of crazy scenario with millions of ontologies which is hard to administrate. So the first step, the first principle is if you want to produce some kind of ontology for something, first look around and see if someone else already designed an ontology. If someone already designed this ontology, want to design, go there, study this ontology and decide if you want to adopt it, to extend it, and only in the last case, last case, produce a new one. This is the rationality. But it's still not so, so uh, followed, let's say. Okay? This is the dream, let's say. Okay? Right? So, people, thank you very much.